Hi everybody. I hope you are all having an enjoyable summer. Today we are going to discuss the dilemma of using 1PN on monopronuclear embryos in IVF. During oogenesis, the oocyte is arrested at the prophase of the first meiotic division. After early surge or any exogenous trigger for ovulation, the oocyte completes the first meiosis and then arrests at the metaphase of the second one. At the time of sperm penetration, the oocyte undergoes activation and resumes meiosis. Following this step, two pronuclei develop from the sperm and the oocyte chromatin. The oogenesis process is ended when two pronuclei and two polar bodies are visible. This step is directly followed by the process of syndomy where the pronuclear membranes break down and the paternal and maternal chromosomes reorganize and unite to form a zygote. The presence of a single pronucleated oocyte has been reported in variable frequencies. The range of incidence of a single pronucleus demonstrated in the literature is between 2 to 6 percent of the inseminated oocyte. However, the incidence is higher following ICSI. As I'm talking, you can see a video of one pair zygote derived from ICSI, which developed into a good morphology blastocyst. Two main mechanisms have been proposed to account for one pair zygotes a parthenogenetic oocyte activation or an abnormal formation of the nuclear envelope. This later could result from the failure to organize a nuclear envelope around one of the parental chromosomes or from the arrangement of the two genetic materials in a single pronucleus. Embryos identified as having a single pronucleus at the fertilization check are generally considered abnormal. As such, the Escher Guideline Group on Good Practice in IVF Laboratories in 2015 recommended they not be used clinically. Several studies revealed that 1PN embryos have a reduced potential for normal progression to cleavage stage embryos and blastocysts compared with 2PN embryos and fewer 1PN derived blastocysts being of good quality. 1PN embryos generated by conventional IVF have a higher developmental potential compared with ICSI embryos. The low developmental potential of 1PN embryos, especially those from ICSI, is presumably in part due to a significant proportion being haploid, which arrest before blastulation. 1PN embryos from conventional IVF may be better than those from ICSI owing to the considerable proportion being misclassified as a result of asymmetrical pronuclei formation, presumably as the time between fertilization and the fertilization check is not as consistent. Using comparative genomic hybridization revealed that almost 50% of monopronuclear blastocysts created following conventional IVF represent a diploid chromosome constitution and between 10 to 30% following ICSI. From recently reports regarding the chromosomal constitution of these resulting embryos, it can be assumed that a considerable number of them could have a normal chromosomal constitution. Furthermore, certain ICSI embryos originating from monopronuclear and two polar body zygotes were reported to have normal chromosomal content. Although births using these embryos have been reported, one pin embryo transfer following ICSI needs to be treated with caution. Improved clinical safety of 1PN embryos could be achieved through culture to the blastocyst stage using time-lapse monitoring system and comprehensive genetic testing for normal chromosome composition, as well as confirmation of B-parental inheritance. Improvement of genetic technologies for prime plantation genetic testing are required to shed light on the genetic makeup of IVF and ICSI blastocysts derived from 1PN embryos. It could be valuable to help in the decision about transferring or discarding them. For some patients, this will provide them the information regarding their only clinically suitable embryo and thus the only chance of obtaining a pregnancy from that IVF cycle. 
This podcast does not encourage the transfer of one pen derived embryos as a general practice. However, discusses the knowledge about their chromosomal constitution and their potential for reproductive use when no other embryos are available. In our next podcast, we will discuss outside dysmorphism and its possible connection with abnormal fertilization. Stay tuned.